This is the Anarchist Wars on entry number 20, and I'm going to go over day three at the Mises Institute, in which we've gone over a lot of good fun lectures on uh, time preference, uh, others on business cycle theory, defending the undefendable with Walter Block. We'll get to him in a second. Uh, the Contra Krugman Show with Bob Murphy. Uh, the origins of central banking and the many times in the past in which it had been attempted in this uh, creation of that evil uh, or in order for it to be shut down and not renewed again. It's charter, so to speak. And, of course, inevitably it comes back, right? Just like uh, De Lorenzo will talk about how some people will uh, vote down taxes, but there are non-voter municipal bonds that they're on the ready to get anyway. So they're still going to get your money. This whole thing is this uh, bread and circus show just to make you have the illusion of control. They're still going to get their money and you're still going to pay for it. And... So that was um, a good day, a lot of good lectures, a lot of good classes, and now I think I should go over some critiques that some of the commentators are finally looking into and seeing where some of this stuff is kind of going to, in terms of uh, hearing some of the responses of the fellow academics that I questioned, right? Uh, in terms of hearing some of the responses from the professors, uh, my uh, documentation of this is just that at this time. Just documenting what is going on at the Mises Institute, what goes on at the university, the kinds of people that you will find there, the kinds of professors that lecture there, uh, what are their views on free market anarchy, uh, what are their thoughts on abolishing government. Uh, it's not a uh, debate setup, as it were, as it um, kind of took place at the Students for Statism, Students for Liberty Conference in DC. Uh, so this is a different format altogether. Um, mostly in that, if this was the Cato Institute uh, or Fee, for example, I would go in with the debate setup. But because the Mises Institute was founded as a non-political organization, um, this means that the format will be different. This is more than in a documentary sort of sense of the experience there. And keeping that in mind, of course, Ludwig von Mises never voted, never advocated for a politician, or had political party affiliation. According to um, the kid, who was there also presented a lecture and had a moment outside of the class to ask him these questions in which he said no, he had never seen him do any of those things. Uh, so the place then is something that I find to be a good ally then, which is very hard to find, right? In terms of uh, what we do here in Richmond for Liberate, we cannot ally with political organizations. So it's, for once, this has been a very refreshing experience to find a non-political one that holds the same views towards ending the state. Of course, that's not to say there are some wild cards in there. Uh, the institution was founded as a separation from the Cato Institute. Uh, I think it just got a little bit too political, right? You, you create that exception and everything starts to come in and unfold and the message goes all over the place. And from there, Rothbard separated himself and uh, helped found uh, the Mises Institute. Also, to put a note there with Lou Rockwell, he himself talked about how the last time he voted was decades ago, which would imply that he did not even vote for the Libertarian Game Party as well. So, a lot of uh, good, honest, I guess, in terms of them revealing their positions and where they stand, um, and of course, people talk about the division of labor. Here's a great division of labor in their pursuit for academia, for uh, increase of a uh, scholarship uh, pursuit of advancing uh, freedom, right? Against the ills of socialism and the ills of government altogether. Uh, you have a lot of course, of course, uh, lecturers, uh, professors that do not entirely agree with one another, a hundred percent as well, right? And in terms of even argumentative um, ethics, in terms of um, the best pursuit of way, perhaps you can say, of uh, achieving freedom in terms of Walter Block, right, with his libertarians for Trump. Um, and given that, though, uh, I would say most of the professors and their honest responses to, you know, are you an enemy of the state, uh, your thoughts on free market anarchy, uh, the abolition of the state itself, of government, uh, there are good responses. And in alignment with anarchy. Of course, there are some responses you'll find that may not be, I would not find to be completely agreeable in terms of like my fellow uh, scholarly students' responses towards maybe saying that so be an incremental approach, right? Which would imply to politics or the idea maybe government could never be abolished or 
uh, a lot of different weird ways and towards exceptions I find a little bit towards politics but that's that's the environment those are the students coming in many of them from all over the world from Brazil um, coming in and that's the experience that got him this far to the finish line of freedom and I think that is an awesome thing to see and the discussion of um, how best to achieve freedom though of course is something separate something different on the side, something that I, that I have engaged with the other students there while I was at the campus. Um, and one person saying like, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, I thought politics was a way to achieve it for a while. Um, in just five minutes, <laughs> he said I was able to convince him otherwise. Uh, and those are the conversations I would like to have with the professors at some point. And that would be, of course, an open um, table, round table discussion as it were, or uh, invitation to an actual debate, right? Especially with Walter Block. Uh, but what you've seen in their responses, education is what they they see now as the way forward and presenting the best case of freedom and achieving it as well and abolishing the state. And that is good to see, right? They didn't say, well, yeah, you should vote uh, for Rand Paul, you should vote uh, libertarian. You didn't hear any of that going on. Maybe perhaps I sort of asked the question to be a lot more um, concretely in that those findings uh, and ask specifically, which one of the two do you think is the best way to achieve freedom? Through politics and compromising our principles, of course, or through education as what is occurring in that facility, at that institute. And they already uh, described that education is the way, as you hear some of their interviews. Of course, somebody was mentioning Tom Woods uh, being a minarchist. I've never heard of that. Uh, that would be new. But of course, there are some things in the past that they have advocated long ago, especially when they were part of the uh, Ron Paul campaign circle there. Right? Many of them were former members of it. Many of them were former staff members there. Um, but where they are now, since that has ended, they no longer advocate for voting. They no longer vote themselves. Uh, there will still be some residual... Uh, connections to that sort of stuff. But of course, you know, you grew up in that sort of stuff, that's still gonna be uh, part of the community that you still kind of reside in a bit sometimes. And so somebody was mentioning bringing up uh, Tom Woods and his advocation of it. And yeah, that would be kind of problemsome and only in one area in which I saw that someone brought up in terms of, um, I guess it's like Liberty Classroom in which they're talking about, you will learn all these uh, arguments uh, against the, the fallacies of uh, socialism, as it were, uh, strong arguments for freedom and limited government. Um, but I didn't see that being in quotation from him saying it, saying that ex exactly, just him describing how fun this class is gonna be and might be the webmasters themselves who produced that website, kind of sneaking these kind of words in, unless uh, there is, uh, a quote from him saying that limited government is the way to go, or I advocate for limited government specifically, that would be something else, right? Uh, and of course, uh, the critiques in terms of um, notification, state notification, uh, he, he, he talked about that when I talked, when I introduced that question to him, that he right now is um, still trying to figure that out, right? So that's, that's a good saving grace, I would say, in terms of him trying to figure out uh, exactly where he where he should stand on that issue. Uh, state notification, of course, would uh, invariably involve an advocation for a political party, for a political ruler to kind of put that stuff in motion. And all of a sudden, now you have to you have to vote. <laughs> all of a sudden, now you have to support a politician. All of a sudden, now you have to support their political party and the agenda that goes with it. Um, and which says uh, anarchists, uh, we don't. Right? We don't support anyone who vies for the throne of tyranny. And it was good to see him being honest and saying that, you know, he's come across some interesting developments in, in that thought since he last advocated in a book, I believe, in 2011, uh, which was quite some time ago. And so that's something uh, that's still in its development still. So uh, in terms of that, if someone can produce otherwise, uh, that he says specifically limited government is the way to go, um, I would say he's still a champion of liberty. Right. And if he does, of course, advocate for limited government, which I don't see to be the case. But if he does, that will be a good moment to have a debate, I would say, or the next time I run into him to present those kinds of questions. Um, but aside from Tom Woods, there is, of course, Walter Block and Walter Block's advocation for Trump 
as it were, and saying that, well, you know, Rothbard, Rothbard was indeed very much interested in politics. He loved the game. Um, and so much that uh, he advocated for Lyndon Johnson, right? Sometimes Walter Block would go in and say that, well, look, Rothbard voted. Yeah, Rothbard voted, and he voted for Lyndon Johnson, who brought in the war on poverty, right? Decimated uh, entire communities. And so in terms of saying, well, Clinton is not going to, I mean, Trump might not start a world war, uh, but Clinton, well, you forget that the state is a war on people. There is already a war here domestically. Um, and to say that you must choose the lesser of two evils uh, would go against the very motto of the Institute, right? To ne cede malice, set contra adentior ito. Do not give in to evil, but proceed ever more boldly against it. And that is something that I find a great motto to stand back, uh, to put forth in that institute. And I would assume then that that is what the professors there uh, stand with. And that is something if um, some people are choosing the lesser of two evils still, that that is a discussion they should have. Or perhaps having a debate would be a great way to you know, clear the table once and for all. So with that, I'm gonna leave you guys to more discussions with my fellow academic students. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you at the Victor Party. So where are you from and what brings you to the Mises Institute? I'm from uh, Connecticut, New Hampshire uh, and uh, study at Johns Hopkins University and I'm here to learn about uh, economic freedom and how to evolve humanity's freedom uh, in a general sense. I'm from Minneapolis. I'm at the Mises Institute today Oh, this whole week for the Mises Institute summer university thing with all professors from all around the country, different uh, Austrian economists come down and they give lectures, we meet people and have a lot of fun. Uh, I live in north central Arkansas. I became involved with the Mises Institute um, because I always had a strong interest in economics from, from a standpoint of agricultural business <laughs> and uh, I was a libertarian from a fairly young age the Austrian school <clears throat> and through the Mises Institute gave me a way of understanding economics and actually understanding the real world. I'm from uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin and I'm here to broaden my understanding of Austrian economics. And so then what do you think of government and should it be abolished? Uh, I think it should. Um, there's various disagreements on how it should be abolished, how quickly should you auction things off that the government owns, should you just let people go in and homestead it uh, but I think overall, there are problems here and there, but I think overall the world would be better off if we abolished government. Government was an evolutionary step that humans took, and I believe that uh, the, that coercive force that w that is government will eventually be evolved away, and we'll have uh, anarchy as a not as it's commonly known throughout the masses, but how is it the actual definition of what anarchy is, and uh, I can only hope that that, that that happens soon sooner than better than later. Is that it should it be abolished? Well, uh, we have to decree it by fiat that may be difficult since when we be getting rid of the state. But no. What is government? Or, yes, I think it should be abolished. Whether that's possible or how it can be done is definitely another question. But the state isn't necessary for the maintenance of social cooperation through the division of labor. It isn't necessary to prosperous human society. And in fact, it's often antithetical to it. I think that government is an attempt to solve complex social problems that have to do with dispute resolution um, that has perverted itself into a uh, the legitimate monopoly of the use of coercive force and, and threat of coercive force in a given territory. What does free market anarchy mean to you then? So, anarchy would refer to the absence of a state, uh, which is difficult for some people to imagine, but it means the absence of some monopolist on the use of force over some territory. And, subject to various other conditions. So anarchism by itself is just the lack of such an institution, but one could have a pretty bad uh, 
society in the abstract. In the case of free market anarchism, it's where those property institutions established that have an existence independent of the state are traded freely on a free market. And that can extend to various things like provision of private security services and so on. And in fact, this thing is, this has been perhaps not the in the way we think of modern markets, but many of these things have been provisioned privately uh, in the past. So we've seen bits and pieces of free market anarchism here and there. Uh, but basically, it's the absence of a state and those things we traditionally assume are associated with states can be provided voluntarily. Uh, free market anarchy would be the removal of an organization in society that has the right to do things to uh, any of its subjects that those subjects don't have the right to do to each other and so it would be the uh, uh, basically uh, an attempt to test whether or not human beings can build a, or an organically developed free society um, with uh, laws that govern anyone without an, uh, without an authority in a given territory. Free market anarchy means the voluntary choice that uh, firms and individuals make with each other that is free of any coercion and benefits has been a ben mutual benefit to both parties. Uh, basically means uh, any voluntary interactions between consenting adults. There's some different rules for children, but basically anything peaceful, anything voluntary should be allowed and anything coercive, anything uh, initiates violence should be banned or not allowed. Are you an enemy of the state? I don't consider anything or anyone my enemy unless they use aggression against me. I very well could be. Well, yes, but, uh, oh, I'm a bit subversive about it. I guess I would say I am. I'm a big fan of Murray Rothbard's in that book. Nice. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's Left behind, the dollar signs rule. But what about the pool who falls victim to the material world?